week five in, your, in our syllabus, and our topic is the synthesis of Paul's theology. Dear loving God, we thank you for another day and another opportunity to learn and grow and to talk about uh, what the Bible teaches about you. And I pray that you open our minds and hearts so that this time together will be valuable for each student. And we pray that your will will be done. And today we pray especially for Lao Win Li, uh, who is recovering from his operation. We pray that you will bring him to complete healing soon. I pray that you'll provide financially for him to be able to pay for this unexpected expensive cost. I pray that you'll comfort his wife and family who are certainly worried about him. And I pray that you will show his friends here how they can be good friends to him in this time of need. And so now we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're going to talk about the synthesis of Paul's theology. And uh, just to make sure you understand the terms here, a synthesis means that we take his thought from all of his different writings. So up to this point, we've, we've done some work to identify a synthesis already. We looked at the core of his gospel, the core of his theology. Uh, we studied the book of Romans and Philippians and Ephesians and Colossians. Uh, so we've covered a, a lot of territory, a lot of his thinking, but not all of his thinking. And so today we're going to systematically go through his theology according to the categories that I've given you for theology. We're going to, and I'm going to, I'm going to quickly go over the parts that we've already discussed, but I'm going to spend more time on some of the subjects that we only talked about briefly or not at all. Let's begin with the broad category of theology, by which we mean today his view of, of God in general, and especially God, the Creator God, God the Father. Point number one. Uh, what, what page are we on in the guide? Okay. Thong Zay Thong. Okay. God the Father is the monotheistic creator of the universe and Father, Abba, in Aramaic, of Lord Jesus Christ, to whom is due honor and allegiance according to the will of God. And then there are many different biblical references there. Now, there are a couple of things to highlight here. First of all, when we say that God is Father, this is, an, this is something that is, that is emphasized in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Father is, uh, doesn't mean that God is male. God is not male or female. But, but Father sim signified an identity of God as the, the creator or the, the progenitor of the human race. But it's more than just a creator. God as Father was to symbolize that there was a, a personal affection for His creation. A personal love for His creation. So that you and I are like considered His children. And as, as a, a good father would love his children, so our Heavenly Father loves us as children. Sometimes people raise the question that if he's father, isn't he also mother? And, and we could say that he, he has the same functions as a mother in the sense that life came from God. In the, in the scriptural text, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, according to the biblical text, However, we don't have any reference to God as mother. And so when Jesus taught us more about God and, and he taught us how to pray, such as in the Lord's Prayer, he used the term Father. And so in Christian theology ever since, most theolo theologians have emphasized this designation of God as Father. Uh, but I want to make sure you don't think that God is male or the male is superior to female. That is not at all what is meant by the designation father. 
Secondly, there is the emphasis on the monotheistic God. A monotheistic God means that God is how many? One, right? Monotheistic God. What other religions in the world emphasize monotheism? What are they? Islam, yes, and Judaism. So which one came first? Judaism, then Christianity, then Islam. So sometimes you will hear people talk about the, the Jewish, Judeo-Christian tradition. Some will say Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. That doesn't mean that all of the religions are identical. It means that they share some common features. One of those features is a belief that God is one. Hinduism, of course, emphasizes many, many gods. Now, for the highly educated Hindu, there is a belief that there's one supreme being behind all those other gods. But most Hindus, Hindus don't know that and don't practice that. Uh, it, so in practice, it's not a monotheistic religion. But according to some teachings, uh, it, it still could be considered well, I, I couldn't really call it a monotheistic religion, but it's a, a religion that emphasizes one supreme God behind all the others. Uh, but today, of course, we're focusing on Paul's view of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Because when Paul wrote, there was no Islam. Okay, so that, that's all I'm going to say about point number one. Point number two is that God is sovereign. Now, I mentioned that last time. God is sovereign. What does it mean for God to be sovereign? Right. God is the ruler over all. So, you can be ruler without power, or you can be, have power without ruling. But God is considered the rightful ruler of the universe, but not everybody follows him. When we talk about sovereignty, we're most often referring to his power, his ability to control the destiny of, of the universe, the creation of the universe and the ultimate destiny. Now that doesn't mean that God, in fact, makes every decision. It means that what God wants to accomplish, he accomplishes. And that nothing can thwart or stop the will of God. That's what sovereignty means. So we're going to look at one passage here. I've given you several. We already looked at Ephesians last week. I mentioned Romans chapter 9, but let's, I have it up here on the screen. And we're going to read verses 10 through 18. Uh, so please look in your own Bibles to Romans chapter 9. And here in Romans 9, Paul is talking about his view of God and the history of God's work with Israel in the history of Israel and God's work today, well, meaning in, in his day. And he's trying to explain to him that what has happened in history is, has happened because God has willed it to happen. God wants it to happen, including who has been exalted and who has been uh, diminished. It's by the power of God. It's by the will of God. Paul is trying to teach us teach the Romans and us by indirectly, that God, God has the power to make his will come to pass. Even if it doesn't make sense to us. Even if it doesn't seem just to us. God has that right as the creator, as the sovereign Lord. So, let's, uh, I think maybe we should back up We'll start in verse 9. I'm going to read it for you, but I have it on the screen as well. For this is a word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. So that's, that's when the Lord was speaking to Abraham. Right? He's quoting from, from Genesis 9.10. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, in order that God's purposes 
according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Okay, do you understand what he's saying in these verses? In Jewish thinking, the firstborn son was, had more rights than the younger son. Right? The firstborn had greater inheritance rights than the secondborn or thirdborn. And, and yet we read in Genesis that, that God, for, the, for, the, for these different uh, children, God chose the younger to be more powerful than the older. In fact, the older is going to serve the younger. Now to the Jewish mind, that's not fair. It's not just. How can that be? How can God do that? And what's Paul's answer to that question? Why, does, why did God switch things around with Jacob and Esau? Why did he switch things around? He did it to demonstrate that he has the right to do that. He did it to demonstrate that if he wants to change the order of power and authority, he can do that as God. That's God's right. And so God decided before Jacob and Esau were born that he would choose Jacob. Was Jacob better than Esau? Was Esau worse than Jacob? Paul says it doesn't matter. God as creator has the right to choose whomever he wishes to choose. That's his point he's trying to make. That's God's sovereignty, God's election. And so as we read, I'll keep reading here, 13, just as it, was, it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. What does that mean? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. What does that mean? As God, he has a right to do that. That's right. That's exactly right. So it, we're making the same point repeatedly, but this is something that most people don't like. So I want to make sure you hear what Paul says. Because we, we often, I think, for those of us who think about this, we, we worry about this. It seems that God is unfair. We want... Many of us are socialists at heart. We want everybody to be treated the same, right? But, the, but Paul says that's not the case. If God wants to have compassion on someone, he will. If he wants to show mercy to someone, he will. But by implication, if he does not want to have compassion on someone, he won't. If he does not want to show mercy, he won't. That's his right as God. All right, and so we keep reading. 9.16 So then it does not depend on the man or person who wills or the person who runs. That means what we want to do or what we do. But on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires to have mercy, and he hardens whom he desires to harden. All right, see the same point again. And I mentioned that last time, Pharaoh is the example. That God hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let Israel go. And because he would not let Israel go, God perform the miracles of the ten plagues to demonstrate the power of God and to bring glory to God and to show that God is able to powerfully rescue his people from, from uh, captivity. And ever since that time, that story has been told over and over again as a, as a way to not only recount history, but it, it, it's highly symbolic 
in the sense of recognizing that God is capable of delivering his people and he can do so powerfully when he wants to. And so Paul's point here is that in order to do that, he had to harden Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh would cooperate with God's will. Pharaoh didn't know that he was cooperating with God's will. But by hardening his heart or having his heart hardened, then he did what God wanted him to do so that God could do some other things. All right, so now we are on, uh, I think we can stop, stop at that verse. Okay. Uh, this is an important verse to, ver these are important verses because while on one hand Paul, Paul is teaching about the sovereignty of God, the freedom God has to choose to do what he wants, there's also a soteriological implication of this. A soteriological implication. In other words, the salvation of the human race is determined ultimately by God in Paul's theology. And that is the basic explanation for why it is that some people believe and other people do not believe. According to Paul, he would say it, it was God's choice. And if you think that's unfair, you have to remember that God is the creator and he can do as he pleases. You can still not like that, but Paul says he has the right to do it. Okay, that's Paul's theology. All right, number three here. Let's, let's go on. God is a covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. Uh, and there are many references here. We won't go into that. I think you know this. Uh, but when we talk about the New Testament, testament is a, another word for covenant. And the Old Testament is, is not just one covenant. It's really a series of covenants that God enacted or put into, into effect over time, over thousands of years. So God is a covenant-making God, but God is also a covenant-keeping God. What that means is, if God makes a promise, He keeps a promise. This is very important for the faith of the followers of Christ and the, those who believe in God. According to Paul, he wants us to know that God is faithful. That's part of the core of his teaching, is that God is a faithful God. And then fourthly, God is a personal God. He's not just a force with personal characteristics. Now, this is a, a very big subject, a big theological subject. Because some of you have studied process theology. How many of you have studied process theology? Anybody? Oh, just one. Well, maybe I should not try to confuse you with theology you haven't studied yet. Uh, but there, there is a type of theology that emphasizes that God is, is more like a force of the universe. That everything is connected and everything really is part of God. It's either pantheistic or panentheistic in the sense that God is, everything is, relates to God and God is that creative force. And you and I can participate as co-creators with God because we are, in fact, God, in part. And traditional theology would not accept that kind of formulation. Because traditional Christian theology emphasizes that God is both transcendent and imminent. You know those words, right? Transcendent is God is other than or beyond human creation. Imminent means he's present with. So process theology, we could say, is the extreme of the imminence of God. But traditional theology, and I believe Paul's theology as well, would like to maintain both this sense of transcendence and imminence of God. What does that mean for us practically? It means that we worship God who is beyond us. So when I worship God, I don't worship you. All right, there's, in the uh, Hindu tradition, there's a, a phrase, namaste. Do you know that? Have you heard of that? Well, that, that literally means I bow to the God in you 
and you bow to the God in me. Okay, that, that's not Christian. Okay, that's not Christian. Uh, and and uh, my point here is, is to say that as you develop your theological thinking, it's important for you to know what Paul teaches, what the New Testament teaches, and what other, others teach. So that when you go and you preach and teach, that you know what you're talking about. That you're not subtly teaching other theology, other philosophy that really contradicts what's in the Bible. That takes work. That's why you're here as a student. But I'm emphasizing these things just to show you that there are some alternatives. And for Paul, he, would, he, he insists that when we worship the Creator God, that God is beyond us. And yet, at the same time, that God is within us. And that's the imminence of God. That's the Holy Spirit within us. Christ within us is God's presence. So in a sense, what we're left with is a, is a, a bit of a paradox. Because we, want, we, we, we need to say, to be true to Paul, that God is beyond us and God is within us. And I think there is a place for each, each emphasis. So rather than put them together, I'd rather hold them side by side. God's transcendence drives me to my knees so that I can worship God humbly. So that I remember I'm not God. I will never be God. I cannot be God. In, inside of me, I'm a human creation who's limited. And I give all my praise and glory to the Creator God. And at the same time, I can praise God that He is in me through His Holy Spirit. And that I have a relationship with God through His Holy Spirit and through Christ. And I can experience the power of God working through me. But that's never a cause for pride. A never a cause for, for self-exaltation. I will always be humble with that recognition and grateful. And I think that's the proper balance between the transcendence and the imminence of God. Okay, so that's, those are four broad statements about Paul's theology. All right, Are you, do, does anybody want to ask any questions about those four statements? Sir, uh, yes. What about uh, as the Bible said, you're a small God. Ah. So what does it mean then? So, so, the, uh, so we are a small God. Okay. Well, I think what it means is that we are created by God. All of us have our, it, all of us have our life's breath from the presence of the Spirit of God in us. And so I think, I think those kinds of references are emphasizing our connection to God. Um, so I think that, that's, and again, you have to hold these two things together, God's transcendence and God's imminence. There is no life apart from God, um, but that doesn't mean we are God. Okay. Uh, we are small gods. <laughs> we, are, we are sons of God. We are created by God. We have our life of God. But there's not one person in this room who could create the universe. Nobody can create a star. You can't create a flower. All right? You can't create a, a, a life. Now, you can participate in the creation of life, right? You can help make a baby. Yeah, so, <laughs> right? Don't do it, though. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so but you have that ability within you, but that doesn't mean you're a god, right? And, and what we find in Paul's theology is Paul, Paul is not a scientist. You know, in a, in a scientist, you would expect to write very careful descriptions and, uh, of something, whether it's a, of a rock or a tree or a star. Scientists try to write exact descriptions for which there's no contradiction. All right, very clear, that's a scientist's goal. But not a theologian. Theologians cannot write with that kind of precision. It's not possible. I don't believe it's possible. And so they must use metaphors and ideas to give us approximations of who God is. Or they talk about different aspects of God so we can see a relationship with God. What can happen, though, very easily, is if you look at just one piece of that, 
it can lead to a misunderstanding or an incomplete understanding. And so when you're doing theology, biblical theology, it's best to put all the statements of God side by side and to recognize that the truth about God is a, a collection of all of those plus what you don't know. Okay, so it's, it's beyond us. But the statements that we have help us to know God and have a relationship with God. So that's my, that's my uh, perspective on it. All right, let's go ahead now and talk about Christology. And I know we're, we're going very quickly for our synthesis. Uh, you, you, you're supposed to take an entire course on systematic theology. Uh, but I'm, I'm just summarizing Paul's... If Paul had a systematic theology, this is, this is, it would be something like this. First of all, we can understand that Paul understood Jesus Christ as a second Adam and a vehicle for God's grace. Let's look at Romans chapter 5. Actually, we'll do 12 through 21. Now, some of you were alluding to this chapter last week. When we were during the question and answer time, we were talking about uh, we were talking about uh, the original sin. So let's talk about what does Paul say about Jesus as the second Adam. I'll read this again, Romans chapter five, beginning verse twelve. It's on the screen. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, so death spread to all men. Excuse me, I'm going to change the translation here to the New International Version because it's more inclusive. And I, I prefer to use inclusive language. Well, doesn't, this one doesn't look inclusive. Let's try a new revised standard. Oh, they all, oh, I see, of course. They have to say one man because it was a man. It was Adam, all right? Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death came through sin, so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If, because of the one man's sin, one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pause there. I think these are hard verses to understand. Okay, this is difficult. It's difficult English. And it's also difficult conceptually. But Paul is simply trying to say sin, came in, sin existed in the world before the law and it was in fact in Adam. And through Adam came sin and came transgression and condemnation for the human race. What he doesn't really explain is how that is so. So does that mean that because of the original sin, that meaning Adam's sin, everyone is born a sinner. That's been the traditional uh, theological position for centuries uh, in the church. Or does it simply mean that because Adam sinned, sin was now in the world, everyone became a sinner because they chose to sin. And that's what I told you last week is my position is I think there's a stronger case for simply saying sin is in the world because of Adam, but I'm not condemned because of Adam. I'm condemned because of my own sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God is what Paul says in 
in, in Romans 3.23. All have sinned. If we were going to be condemned just because of Adam, Paul would not have needed to say all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He simply would have said you're all condemned because of Adam. But he doesn't say that. That's not really what his argument is. What Paul is trying to do here is set up a parallel between Adam and Christ. His real subject is not Adam at all. His real subject is Christ. And he's trying to help them understand the significance of Jesus Christ. And he's trying to under, help them understand the scope of, of Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us. The scope means that just as what Adam did brought condemnation to the world eventually, so Christ's sacrifice brought justification to the world. It's that big. Now the question you might want to ask is, does that mean that everyone will be saved? Well, Paul doesn't answer that question, but it's a good question. And it's going to go back to this question we're going to talk about all semester. Is Paul exclusive or is Paul inclusive? Because there are these verses, theological points, that can go one way or the other. All right, let's continue reading Romans 8, 5, 8, 18 through 21. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads, leads to justification and life for all. For just as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Okay, so do you see, you see the parallel? Adam, disobedience, condemnation. Jesus, obedience, righteousness, and justification. As Paul likes to do, he creates an argument as an illustration. It's a contrast, a sharp contrast. But don't make too much of one verse or one idea. For example, when he says, by the one man's obedience, we will be made righteous. So does that mean that you're saved because Jesus was obedient? But the only reason he says, by one man's obedience, is that he's contrasting it to Adam's disobedience. He's creating a, a contrast. Because you know very well from other parts of Romans that he believes it was Christ's sacrifice that brought us salvation. Not his obedience. But he was obedient to God to be sacrificed. So it's true, it's just not complete. So be very careful when you're preaching on any verse in the Bible that you don't take one verse and say this is now all the truth. And this is what happens sometimes with cults, evangelists, individuals who are not well educated. They take one verse and they say, look, now this is the truth. See, it says right here in the Bible. But you always have to read verses in the bigger context of what else does Paul teach. All right, uh, the last two verses, 20. But law came in with the result that the trespass multiplied. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that just as sin exercised dominion in death, so grace might also exercise dominion through justification, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, a lot of details there. This is one of the main passages that those who believe in original sin point to. Original sin is not the main point of this passage. It's really to say that Christ is the second Adam, and what we have in Christ is more powerful and greater than what we lost in Adam. That, that's what he's, the theological point he's making here. But we're talking about Paul's Christology here, and so we're saying first he's the second Adam, second he's the Son of God, and now third, Jesus is the Savior. 
Jesus is Savior in the past, present, and the future. Uh, and we're going to come back to this later. But when we talk about Jesus being the Savior, He was the Savior before creation. He was the Savior on the cross. And, he, and he's, our, he's your Savior through your personal experience. And He's going to be your Savior on Judgment Day. And later I'm going to show you a chart to help you see how Jesus Christ functions as a Savior in Paul's theology on, at many different points throughout history. Point number four, the Lord Jesus. So let's take a look at this passage. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Remember, we looked at these verses earlier. We looked at 5, 6, 7, 8, where Jesus humbled himself. Remember Philippians? He humbled himself, became, took the form of a servant, and, and was obedient even to the point of death. But now, these are the three verses that follow. Therefore God also exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. All right? So, you may remember, I tried to, to demonstrate the movement of these six verses to say that, God, that Jesus was equal with God in heaven. Right? But he chose not to grasp onto that. He did not think equality with God was something to be grasped. But he let go of it. And he humbled himself, made himself lower and lower and lower to become, take the form of a human being and the form of a servant, even to the point of dying on the cross for us. So this is the, the descent of Jesus, D-E-S-C-E-N-T, the descent of Jesus to the most humble place. But Paul says that God did not leave him in that humble place. Because of his obedience, God exalted him. He ascended to the highest place. So the one who was in the highest place voluntarily took the lowest place and God the Father exalted him to the highest place. And what does that mean for you and me? It means we're to recognize that he has been appointed the Lord of the entire universe. Okay, this is one more concept side by side with the others. Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior. Now he's saying Jesus is also the Lord. Why is that important? Because we need to know to whom we should give our, our allegiance. You cannot have two lords in your life. You cannot have two masters. You cannot have two primary leaders. And so Paul is trying to, to be very clear and say, we, the human race, now has only one Lord, and that's Jesus Christ. Well, do you think this theological point has relevance for our discussion about the place of Christianity with other religions? Is this relevant? You see, the... A pluralistic point of view puts Jesus Christ on an equal plane with Muhammad and Moses and Buddha and, and, and other religious leaders, right? They're, these are different religious leaders. According to these verses, do you think Paul thinks that Jesus Christ is equal to other religious leaders? Yes? No? No, no, not impossible. Impossible for Paul's theology. Now, we, we still have a theological challenge to understand about other religions. Okay, so I'm not saying we don't have a, a very big challenge. It's a very big discussion. But in this class, we're trying to understand what does the Bible teach? What does Paul, what did Paul believe? Because our theology should come from the Bible as the foundational point. And Paul, in Paul's mind is that Jesus is exalted to a place that's above every religious figure ever. And thus he 
has that role of Lord. His name is above every other name. That's what Paul says. Uh, so, you may choose a different theology uh, someday. Some of you may choose a different theology. But don't confuse your different theology with what the Bible teaches. Or what Paul teaches. Okay? Alright, so... Jesus is the second Adam. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior. He's the Lord of the universe. And lastly, uh, I want to emphasize the greatest Christological affirmation is that he really was one with God and he's the image of the invisible God. Now, we're not going to read this again because we read this when we studied Colossians chapter 1. We already looked at that. Uh, but this is... Uh, of all of Paul's writings, Colossians 1 is the, is the strongest statement about who we saw Jesus Christ to be. And really, he's one with God. Jesus Christ shared in, in, the, in the creation of the universe. He's the invisible image, or he's the, excuse me, he's the visible image of the invisible God. Uh, that was Paul's theology. All right, do you have any questions about Paul's Christology about what I just shared. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about soteriology. Here we're going to look first at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. According to Paul, salvation is linked to the real death and bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we find in 1 Corinthians 15 a summary of his belief, the tradition that he received about what happened to Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. And so this 1 Corinthians 15 is often looked to as a, as a key passage to explain what Paul believed about the literal death and, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here we, we'll read again 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received. Okay, in other words, he didn't make this up. It wasn't revealed from God. It's, it's a tradition he, he received. I mean, some, some came from God. But this is, what he's saying is this is the apostolic tradition that he received that he's been passing on to the others. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And so, even though Paul talks very little about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, it is important to him to state that the Christian tradition that he received was that Jesus Christ bodily died on the cross and bodily rose from the dead. Which religion denies that Jesus Christ bodily died on the cross? Which religion? Do you know? Islam. Islam. In the Quran, Muhammad taught that at the very last minute, Jesus was snatched away, taken to heaven, and somebody else was put in his place on the cross. And so, whereas Islam respects Jesus as a great prophet, and Islam believes that Jesus is going to come back again one day from heaven. So, we agree on those two points. At the most important point for Paul's theology, Islam changes the story. And instead of saying that Jesus Christ died for our sins, 
Islam says he didn't die at all. So, in Muhammad's mind, I think, he, he was protecting Jesus. He was giving Jesus a higher status. But Muhammad did not understand or rejected Paul's theology that Jesus Christ had to die and his death brought us our salvation. It's a very, very important point of, of difference. Which religion denies that says Jesus died on the cross, but he wasn't resurrected? Judaism. Okay, Judaism. So Judaism says he died, but wasn't resurrected. Islam says he didn't die, but he went to heaven. So you see, there's some things in common, but at critical points, there are differences. These aren't small differences. These are huge differences for Christian theology. Okay. Uh, I, I keep referencing other religions in this class because we live in such a pluralistic context. So that's why I'm, I keep talking about other religions, even though this is a New Testament theology. I want you to understand your theology, but understand how it is the same, but how it's also different from other religions. Okay, so let's, let me see what time is it. Uh, okay, let's talk about one more. Paul believed in substitutionary concept of atonement. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement, he says in Romans 3.25. Thus Jesus died for our sins to bring believers redemption from our sins. Romans 4.25, 1 Corinthians 15.3, and Galatians 1.4. Salvation is in and through Christ's sacrifice, but it comes through a dynamic process of being washed and renewed by the Spirit. Romans 5.1-19, and Titus 3.5-7. Okay. Now, in your systematic theology class, but I want you to see there's a little 18. It's a footnote. And if you look down below it, I say, see Appendix 6 for a brief discussion on theories of atonement. So let's turn to, the, to that appendix right now. So turn in the back of your guide to Appendix number 6. And for me, that's on... Teia Nisei Kong, 127. Can you find that? Is that the right page? Is it the same page? Teia Nisei Kong. Okay, Nisei Kong. All right. Let me, I'm going to read this page to you, even though we, we don't have enough time to discuss it in depth. But you need to understand that this subject of the meaning of Jesus' death and the, and the definition of atonement is debated. It's a very important concept for you to think about. Most of the theories of atonement were developed after the New Testament was completed. But they're based more or less on extrapolations from biblical teachings. The following summary is based on the work of a progressive modern theologian, Tony Jones. He identifies seven different ideas about atonement. First is the penal substitution. That's Anselm's satisfaction theory. That's more or less the, 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 the one that's, that you know about. It's, it's the best known theory. It's the one that's most often taught by Baptists. But there are other ideas. In the Orthodox Church, they believe in union with God. And so they don't talk about so much about Christ dying for our sins. They talk about through Christ we can become one with God through His Spirit. And by becoming one with God, that's how we're saved. It's a different idea. Number three, ransom captive. There are people in the early church, and, and one representative might be, or one representative verse might be Mark 10:45. And that idea is that somehow God tricked Satan, or C.S. Lewis believed that or, or taught about that. He tricked Satan into killing Jesus, not knowing that by killing Jesus, he was providing the ransom to rescue us from our sins. Again, 
we don't know what to think about that, but there's one verse, Mark 10, 45, that says, the Son of Man, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. <coughs> so ever since, the question is, a ransom is, is when you pay money, right? Some, somebody's kidnapped, you pay money, and they give you back the child who was kidnapped or the person. But the question is, is if the ransom theory is correct, who got paid? Who did God pay to get us back? Did he pay the devil? I mean, it doesn't really make sense to us, but it is an idea of the early church. Number four, there's an idea called Christus Victor, uh, Latin idea. And that idea is basic Latin words. Basically, the idea is Christ conquered death by entering into it. So it's, it's more mystical in the sense that Christ, by dying, entered into death and gained victory over death. Now, we don't know how he did that. Uh, and there's no parallel in, in Scripture. But this is one, other, one additional idea about atonement. Number five, he's a moral exemplar. Peter Abelard says that Christ shows us the way. So in other words, by, by Christ showing us obedience to God, even obedience to death on a cross, he shows us that if, if we follow his example, we too will be saved. <coughs> and that's more popular among people who who believe that we have to somehow earn our own salvation by our own righteousness. Number six, the last scapegoat. That's a more of a modern concept by René Girard. The idea is that scapegoat, scapegoat is actually innocent. So Jesus is innocent, but by the, the community putting to death an innocent person that makes the community guilty. And we share in the guilt. But the, but the scapegoat, the Jesus Christ as the scapegoat, winds up dying to expose our guilt, which God forgives somehow. Number seven, we have the idea of Christ as a substitution, which is more idea number one, but without the penal. In other words, it wasn't paying a penalty but he did die for us. He died in our place. And this idea is, has been championed by Mircea Wolf. He's a contemporary theologian. He's at Yale Divinity School in the United States. He comes out of uh, Bosnia. Uh, and very interesting theologian. I think that if you're interested in a theology that grows out of great suffering and persecution. Don't just read liberation theology. Read a Mircea Wolf, who has a different perspective. His idea is that Christ's death repairs the rupture in our relationship with God. In this view, Christ is the inclusive substitution. Jesus is the God who was wronged. Okay, he was wronged. And, and you can see why that would be appealing to people who have been wronged, people who have suffered from injustice. We look at Jesus and we say, look, he was wrong too. But you see how different that, let's look to Jesus who will deliver us from the enemy. This theory says, let's look to Jesus who suffered as we're suffering. And he brings us salvation spiritually. He gives us hope and encouragement because just as he was treated unjustly. He was even killed as some of us are killed. We have eternal hope because God vindicated him. God saved him. God will save us. But not politically, not socially, but eternally. So you see, there are many different ideas about how exactly Jesus saves us. And so the dominant view is that first view. The dominant view in Paul, if we take all of Paul's verses, the ones that I gave you here, I think you would see the dominant view is that Jesus Christ 
had to die on the cross. He had to shed blood so, how, so, so somehow to provide a sacrifice for us. That's the dominant view. But think about this. What if Paul's theology was simply contextual theology? Okay, I'm not saying that it was. I'm saying, think about this. In other words, remember, Paul's theology came out of which religion? Judaism. Judaism had, was a religion of animal sacrifices. They understood atonement through blood, sacrifice. What if, what if Paul was simply chose, in his context, the idea of atonement, they, the Jewish people would understand. Animal sacrifice, only Christ's sacrifice is superior to animal sacrifice. Now, the one, I like that idea, but I have to pause because Paul primarily preached to Gentiles. Well, some Gentiles also had the idea of blood sacrifice. They certainly had the idea of pouring out a sacrifice like a drink offering. So, they, so even in the other contexts in the ancient world, not just Judaism, there was the idea of blood sacrifice. So to me, the intriguing theological concept is, do we still need to talk about atonement in terms of blood sacrifice? Paul's theology, Paul's teaching says yes. But in modern theology, I think we could rightly question that. But if you're going to talk about it differently, how are you going to talk about it? If you're going to choose a different metaphor, what are you going to choose? And, and will it still fit with the, the broad teaching, the broad Judeo-Christian tradition? Well, that's really a question for your theology class, more than here. Our job here is to try to understand what Paul says in his context and to understand that there are some different ways to think about it. But when you leave here and you preach and teach in the church, if you preach that Jesus Christ had to die for our sins and his death on the cross brought us salvation, you will be faithful to Scripture. But I want you to understand, too, that the real understanding of it is perhaps too difficult for us to really understand. I think it's beyond our ability. Why exactly does God need blood? I don't know the answer to that question. And for some people it's a stumbling block. Some people would say, oh, the God of the Bible is a bloodthirsty God. He wants blood sacrifices. I don't believe in that God. I, I, think, I think that's too, too shallow an understanding. The teaching about God wanting blood sacrifice is something that was understood in their context. Today we don't make blood sacrifices, so I emphasize God's love. I emphasize God's sacrifice. I emphasize God's relationship. I emphasize God's spirit, because those are all terms I think are relevant in our modern world. But I don't leave out the cross. I don't leave out the blood. I just don't emphasize the blood as much as I think they had to emphasize it here. All right, these are things for you to think about. Thirdly, salvation is based on the promises of God. That's the covenant idea. Offered by His grace, received by faith, and experience because of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Now we've talked about Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 many times. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that again. Uh, but we could also look at uh, Romans 3, 24 through 29. Uh, very important. So let's just briefly look. Well, actually, we won't do that. We've already looked at Romans 3. Uh, so let's go ahead. Number 4. The law was never a means of salvation. For the Jews, the covenant of God was offered by grace and received by faith. 
According to Paul's writing to the Galatians, the law had two purposes. One, it was added because of transgressions. And thus the law helps us to know God's will and to know covenant responsibilities. Okay? So it's, it's also, thus it serves as a, a restraint on sin. And so the law was given, in other words, to help the Jewish people know what's right and what's wrong. And to help them know that how God wanted them to live. He gave them a covenant, but he wanted them to know their covenant responsibilities. And it seemed like the design was to help restrain or limit their sins. So that's the first purpose of the law. But Paul says there's a second purpose of the law. B, the law was intended to lead us, those who are held prisoners by the law, to Christ. And there we can look up uh, Galatians 3, 22 through 24. And, and there's more technical language to this, uh, but we really don't have time to talk about this. But, but historically, what this means is that Paul believed that the law was intended to drive us to the place where we realize we cannot save ourselves. We need a savior. And so that ultimately, the law, which is good, shows us that we need a savior who is Jesus Christ. So that's the second purpose of the law. Now Luther and the reformed scholastic theologians introduce a third idea of the law for Christians. And that third idea is that the law still serves as a guide for Christians today. That's why in, in the United States and in many communities you could see the Ten Commandments uh, posted on the wall of the courtroom. And you could say what does what does the Old Testament law have to do in a Christian community or a Christian courtroom? Well, Christians have believed that the Old Testament law, especially the Ten Commandments, are still true for Christians today. Not as a means of salvation, but as a guideline to moral conduct. And so, when, you talk about, when we talk about the purpose of the law, we should never think that the law is bad or that Paul was against the law. He wasn't against the law. But what he was against was the idea that the law, following the law, could somehow save a person. That's what the Judaizers seemed to, to teach. The Judaizers came along and said, yes, you can believe in Christ, but you also must obey the law for salvation. And he said, no, that's not right. Yes, we can follow the moral teaching of the law because it got, that's what God wants us to do, but it's not the basis for our salvation. So that's what the whole discussion is related to law and gospel. All right, and I've given you some verses here uh, that you can look up on your own uh, if you want to discuss that subject further. That, by the way, it would be a very good topic for a New Testament theology paper. Point number five, the cross has power to save sinners. Now, that doesn't mean a cross is magical. Like if I hold up a cross and touch you, suddenly you're saved. That's not what I mean. It means that what God did through Christ on the cross saves us. That's what I mean by that. <laughs> and that idea is foolishness to those who do not believe. But the cross is the power of God for those who are being saved, Paul teaches. And there's a good reference here. I think we have a couple, two Anglicans, is that right? All right, I'm not going, not going to go any further about that because we, we just need to keep moving. So now I want to talk about the timing of salvation. As I said earlier, Christ is a savior from the beginning of time, before the beginning of time, through time, and, and into the future. But I gave you a, a chart here in your guide to, to illustrate, or to, well, to illustrate this 
timeline from the past to the, to the future. We can see here that we have salvation. The salvation was in the mind of God before creation. Right? And, and that ties in with what we read in Ephesians chapter 1. Where he says, you were chosen. Colossians. You were chosen. You were elected before the beginning of time. Before creation. To be God's children. So in other words, it was in God's mind. So you could say, in a sense, you were saved before you were born. But that's only part of the truth. We're also saved by what Christ did on the cross. All right? I guess I left one out here. Created, we were created to be in relationship with God. That's part of what was in God's mind. But now, according to Romans 3.25, God provides salvation through Christ's work on the cross. So, what some theologians emphasize is that you were saved when? When Christ died on the cross. That's when you were saved. And so some theologians will say that everything that you needed was already done on the cross 2,000 years ago. But that's not all of what Paul taught. What Paul taught, not taught, what he taught. According to 1 Thessalonians 1.10 and Titus 3, 3 through 7, let's read Titus 3, even though I think we'll probably read that next week. Let's just read that. That's Titus 3, 5. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. Okay, that's, that sounds like Romans chapter 1. Right, doesn't it? That should remind you of Romans 1. So this is, this is why I say there are many places in, in Titus and the pastoral epistles that, that are very much in keeping with Paul's theology in the undisputed books. Here's one of them. So we're all sinners. But Titus 3, 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, that's Jesus, He saved us. Not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's Romans 5. Romans 3 and Romans 5. Now, he doesn't mention Jesus yet. In Romans, he would, he would have mentioned Jesus first, and then in Romans 8, he would have mentioned the Spirit. But Titus goes right to the Spirit to talk about our cleansing and rebirth. It's not a contradiction, because it's the same, same elements. It's just expressed a little bit differently. But it's still the idea, we're not saved by our works. We're saved by God's mercy. That's what we read throughout Romans. In Titus 3, 6, this spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What I'm, what I'm saying here by these verses is that Paul believed that there was a rebirth that takes place in the lives of those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. A rebirth. That should sound a lot like John. John chapter 3, we have to be born again. But Paul's not John, but Paul has the same idea here, in Titus anyway, of being reborn through the Holy Spirit. And this rebirth suggests or indicates that salvation is experiential. Experiential. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so the point I'm making here about uh, uh, this chart that goes from left to right is that even though Christ died for your sins, you don't experience it until you're reborn by the Holy Spirit. And so in other words, you're saved at a point in time in history. The day that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the day that you experience the Holy Spirit 
washing you, forgiving you, cleansing you, is the moment of your salvation, according to Paul. So you see, there are many moments, aren't there? It's not just one moment. But every moment is important in Paul's theology. And then today, we have the experience of eternal life now. And then here we have John, which of course is not Paul. But there's also a passage in 1 Corinthians 1.18. Uh, we'll look at that quickly. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So here again, as he says in 1 Thessalonians, which we'll look at next time, is, is the power of God is alive and real in the lives of those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And so we should, for those who are being saved by Christ, it is an ongoing process of being saved. And then finally, final judgment. In Philippians 3.20, he says, we, we are awaiting a Savior from heaven who's going to come and transform our bodies. And that's the final transformation. And so the question to you is, at what point are you saved? At what point is anybody saved? Well, let me ask you this, another question. How many of you are, would say you're saved? S-A-V-E-D. Raise your hand. I'm very glad to see most of you think you're saved. That's good. All right? If you're not saved, you, you're something you don't understand about the biblical theology. All right? This is an important concept. But my question to you is, the second question is, when were you saved? At camp? At church? At home? <laughs> Do you understand my point? You, you were saved before the beginning of time. You were saved when Christ died for you on the cross. You were saved when you accepted Jesus Christ. You are being saved when Christ is at work in your life now. And you will be saved in the future when Christ comes back again. So don't be confused when people say, Oh, you were saved. Or no, you haven't been saved yet. It's all of these in Paul's theology. All of this is part of salvation. And... And all of them are important. And so for those who, who think that all, the only thing that matters is your experience of salvation, and you're getting nervous because maybe you haven't had a big moment of salvation, for you, you need to know that you were saved when Christ died on the cross for you. And if you have faith in Him, you're saved. So trust in that. But for those of you who are all about history, all about uh, Christ died for me so everybody's saved, then I say to you, but have you experienced salvation? Have you gotten on your knees and bent your knee and said, Jesus Christ, be my Savior. I accept you as my Savior and Lord. Because that's the experiential part. And for those of you who accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, Ten years ago, are you experiencing the power of God today? Because that too is part of your salvation. Okay, that's Paul's teaching on salvation and the timing of salvation. So timing, you see, it's not just about timing. My point in teaching you this is for you to understand the, the richness of the idea of salvation has many dimensions to it. Okay, let's go on now and talk about eschatology. Because we've talked very, very little about eschatology so far in this class. The basic concept, uh, the basic phrase that's used to explain Paul's, both his idea of, of of our experience with God and, and, and experience with God's salvation and his eschatology is this phrase, now and not yet. And I hope you've heard that before, now and not yet. 
Now you have been saved. But you have not yet experienced all that God has for you. And I, I, I really appreciate that theology. Because God has done so much for me. I am so grateful for forgiveness, for his love, and for the way he uses me for good in the world. I'm grateful. At the same time, I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. Because I see that I'm still a sinner. I see that I'm, I'm not all of who God wants me to be. I'm not who I want to be. Right? And so the not yet part of his theology gives me hope that there's more still ahead. Now I have it now, but there's more ahead. It's still coming. And I'm looking forward to that. And I'm working toward that in as much as I can. Cooperating with the Holy Spirit. But the, the fullness of salvation is still ahead, Paul would say. So let me talk about some of these things. Number one, the definition of biblical hope. Biblical hope. Biblical hope is not a wish. Hoping something happens that seems unlikely or improbable. But a solid expectation that God will deliver on his promises. Okay? We have, a, we have something in the United States called the lottery. Have you heard of the lottery? L-O-T-T-E-R-Y. How many of you have heard of a lottery? Okay, that's when you give some money. And they make a big pool of money. Then they pick one name. And the winner wins it all. Okay. It, it's actually gambling. Okay. It's not a good idea. Because you probably are not going to win. But some people play the lottery. And everybody who plays the lottery wishes that they will win. I wish I will win. I wish, I hope, they might say, I hope I win, I hope I win, I hope I win. But do, do you think they, they believe they're going to win? No. They just hope they're going to win. It's a wish. When Paul talks about hope, he's not talking about a wish. I hope Jesus comes back. I hope, I hope, I hope. You know, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe. No, that's not his belief. When he says, our hope is that Christ is returning. Our hope is in life after death. He, what he means by that is that belief is solid and sure. And that gives you hope today. It gives you encouragement today. So that you don't give up. So that you don't quit the race. So that you don't uh, stop following Jesus. Your hope is solid and secure. So that's Paul's theology. So when you read the word hope, always remember it means something that gives you encouragement, but it's solid. The resurrection of the body and immortality is part of that hope. Now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 15. We haven't looked at that yet uh, for later verses. Let's start by looking at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 38 through 57. Okay, so this is, again, a big subject, but I want to read a key passage in 1 Corinthians. Because Paul is talking about what happens after you die. But not, not at the moment of your death, but what happens at the end of time. That's his eschatology. At the very end, when Christ resurrects us, what takes place? 38. But God gives it, that means our, our souls, a body as he has chosen. And to each kind of seed, its own body. Not all flesh is alike, but there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one thing, and that of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. Indeed, star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown, like a seed, is perishable. The seed dies. But what is raised is imperishable. It means it doesn't die. 
It is sown in dishonor. Now he's referring to the body. You know, decayed body. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, but it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a, li a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Do so you see this again? The same thing we saw in Romans 5. He's contrasting Adam with the second Adam, Christ. As was the man of dust, Adam, so are those who are of the dust. That's us. And, in, and as is the man of heaven, Christ, so are those who are of heaven. That's going to be us. Just as we have been born in the image of the man of dust, Adam, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven, Christ. What I'm saying, what I'm saying brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the perishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. There's a lot in these verses. But I think you, you understand the main point. This is not about science. Okay? This is not a science book. So that you will know exactly what's going to happen to your body. It's not like that. He's just trying to contrast the physical body which must die with Christ's body who died and was resurrected and went on to heaven who has become a life-giving spirit. But we don't just become a spirit. We're clothed with a new kind of body. That's Paul's belief. That at the end of time, we will be clothed with a new body. Those who are still alive will be clothed. Those who have died will be raised from the dead and they will be clothed. Now, I think you all know this kind of teaching from your traditional Baptist background. But this is the key passage. 1 Corinthians 15 that talks about this. There's another one, 2 Corinthians 5. We don't have time to look at it, but I, I have the reference here in your, in your text. Okay, so resurrection of the body is very important. And notice that Paul believes that the kingdom of God really is something ahead after the resurrection. And so that's very different from an idea that we find sometimes in the Gospels or in some the theologies today, the kingdom of God is right now. I think a fuller understanding of Paul is to say that it's now and not yet. It's now and still ahead. And so the kingdom, we have a taste of the kingdom of God because we have the Holy Spirit. We have the church. And so the kingdom of God is in part functioning now. But the real kingdom of God that Paul envisions is after death. So that's quite different from an idea that believes that you and I can bring the kingdom of God here on earth now. So think about that. So if you are 
a believer that it's up to us to bring the kingdom of God here now that's not really what Paul taught it's not what he taught okay all right, uh, the B, 3B, the Spirit has been given as a guarantee of our redemption. I mentioned that. And Christ is coming back in the clouds. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. No, point number four, what happens when believers die? die? Now there are very, various answers that are offered by theologians. Some people believe that there is an immediate resurrection. Some believe that there's soul sleep. In other words, our souls just go to sleep. <coughs> a Catholic Church has taught that there's pur purgatory, that our souls go and, and we have to be refined and made purified through the fires of purgatory so that we will be made worthy to go to heaven. And then there are others who say that no, we simply rest in Sheol. Each of those ideas has some basis in Scripture. Paul does not answer this question directly. Instead, he says, those who sleep, he uses that word sleep as a euphemism for death. <coughs> those who sleep in the Lord will come with the Lord when he returns to join those who are still alive at his second coming. And you can read about that more in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Point two, those who die go to be present with the Lord in some manner. In Philippians 1.23, Paul said, It's better for me to depart and be present with the Lord uh, than to stay here. And number three, in Romans 8, Paul says, Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So let me, let me try to summarize this. How should you teach about this in the church? I think the best, the best way to summarize Paul's teaching is that when your loved one, a loved one dies, who has faith in Jesus Christ, you can say that this person's soul is present with Christ. Now that's not the resurrection. It's not, it's not God's final redemption of that person. But they're safe and they're secure. They're at peace with God. They're in God's hand. They're in the presence of Christ. But there is still a day in the future when all the dead in Christ will be raised and then we will be given new bodies. And it's at that time there will be the, the bringing in of the kingdom of God in, in a new way. And Paul says that's the time when, when we will be transformed much more like angels, we could say, have the ability to live forever. But the best example would be Christ. We become like Christ, resurrected from the dead, given an immortal body, that we may live in the kingdom of God forever with God. Now, I want to make a comment about New Testament eschatology. We find differences and tensions among the various prophecies and teachings about the end of the end times in the New Testament. We are thus left with many questions that cannot easily be answered. First of all, will Christ establish his rule here on earth? Or will there be a new heaven and a new earth? Two, will Christ rapture believers to heaven? That means take them up out of this world by coming partway to earth and returning to heaven with them? Or will he be escorted by those who have died in Christ and come down to earth where he will establish his rule? Is Christ's rule on earth literal or is it figurative? Is Christ's rule now or is it in the future? What needs to be in place before Christ returns? And now here's the hardest one. Is Christ's return literal or figurative? If figurative, what does it symbolize? So, in other words, we know that the return of Christ is clearly taught in the New Testament. Because there's no question. The bodily return of Christ is taught in the New Testament. But there are some today who say, but is that really true? Is that really, is that supposed to be taken literally or is it just symbolic? 
that somehow his resurrection, his, his return means something else, not a bodily return. We've had people come here as special speakers in chapel. A, a man from Sweden came and spoke one year, and he says, I don't believe in the return of Christ. So his teaching is, there's nothing to wait for. It's up to you. You change the world. Okay? That was his theology. And so there are people who believe that. If it's only symbolic, what is this symbolic of? Why would we teach the return of Christ if it isn't literal? I don't have an answer for that question. What difference does it make whether one believes Christ's return is literal or symbolic? What difference does it make? Now I know for some of you, the preaching that Christ could come back any day is an important part of your tradition. How many would say that? In your church tradition, the pastor often preaches, be ready, Christ can come back any day. Raise your hand. Say, yeah. So there, there would be many of you, uh, or at least a minority. Well, that has great value. Why? Because it helps you stay alert, right? Keeps you from being lazy and, and, uh, and uh, immoral. Because you think, wait, he could come back any day, I better be ready. I, I think that's a good purpose, to keep people alert. But here, at school, academically, theologically, we should think about that. He hasn't come back in 2,000 years. Do we, do we literally think he could come back any day? Well, you have to answer that question. I can't answer that question for you. I went through many years of my life, decades, saying it doesn't matter. I, I think he's coming back one day, but he hasn't come back yet, and he probably isn't coming back in my lifetime. I mean, how do I know? So I should focus on this life. And I think that had some value because I wasn't just sitting there always looking for Jesus somewhere. I could focus on my wife and my children and my church and my community. That's a good thing. But lately, in recent years, I keep, when I keep looking at, at the writing of Scripture, the teachings on heaven and the teaching on hell, the teaching on Christ coming back again, this was important to the New Testament writers. Now I think that they, they really believed he was coming back in their generation. And we now know that they were wrong. They were mistaken about that. He didn't come back, at least not that we know of. But still, is it important to continue to teach he could come back any time? I think, I think for me the answer is yes. We should still teach this. But not, not to frighten the people. Not to get them to take their eyes off of their poverty and their suffering. I don't think it's a main theme. It's a theme, but not the main theme. The main theme of the New Testament is that Christ came in the first time. And that there's salvation through Christ. And that there's life through the Spirit now. Those are the main things. And I think that the promise of Christ coming back is to say that, in part, that what we experience now is not everything. There's still more. Because this is also true. That the people to whom you preach the gospel, the people who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, the people who praise God for His salvation, are also suffering. And some of them are going to die. No, all of them are going to die. But all of them, some of them are going to die early. Some of them are going to, to have tragic things happen in their life. Some will be attacked by forces outside of themselves. Terrible things happen in the world. The message that Christ is coming back again one day, the message that the kingdom of God is still ahead, the message of the resurrection from the dead, gives us hope beyond our present day suffering. It's important to be part of our message. But it shouldn't be the focus. It shouldn't be the only thing we focus on. Okay, that's it on eschatology. Uh, 
uh, I guess I, uh, let me read this final paragraph here. Key to Paul, Christ is coming back and we need to be ready. In other words, we need to hold on to our faith in Christ as our Savior and Lord. We need to live as children of the light who have been called out of darkness to live as Christ's followers and witnesses to others who do not know Christ. Okay. Uh, so I think that is, that's the center to Paul. All right. I'm going to take a, uh, we're going to take a few more minutes here to talk about uh, pneumatology. Pneumatology, and this is a, again a very good subject for a term paper. Some of you I know are already writing on Paul's pneumatology. But Paul emphasizes the new life by the Spirit in the here and now. Yes, Jesus is coming back one day. Yes, the kingdom of God is still ahead for Paul. But the experience of a redeemed life is for the present through the Holy Spirit. And so the most important passage, I mean there are a couple, but I think the most important passage on this subject is Romans chapter 8. So please turn to that and we'll read uh, the first nine verses. In Romans chapter 7, Paul said, The power of sin is so great that I don't do what I want to do. And now all of us have that experience, right? You have the experience of, of wanting to do good, but sometimes you choose to do bad. That's the human condition. That's the power of sin in our lives. Luther said, that will always be your condition. Fortunately, you're simultaneously a sinner and simultaneously saved. So praise God, by the grace of God, even you and I who are under the power of sin are still saved because of God's grace. But other theologians, including the Catholic Church, says, that's too negative, that's too pessimistic. And I would say too, by reading carefully what Paul teaches, namely chapter 8 of Romans, not just chapter 7, we, we read that Paul really does expect that we, our lives will be different. But it's not because of our power, it's because of the power of the Holy Spirit that we can have the hope of a different life. So let's, let me read those verses. I'm going to read just 1 through 8. I think you can see them on the screen. First of all, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 724. So after Paul says that he, he doesn't do what he wants to do, and he does what he doesn't want to do, he says in chapter 7, verse 24, Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Have you ever asked that of yourself? Have you ever felt like, who will rescue me from this person that I am? Uh, that's Paul's theology. And so if you feel that way, Paul understands. Because he felt that way too. And so he cries out, who's going to rescue me? In other words, who's going to save me? And then verse 25, he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he's saying his theology is that who's going to rescue him? It's God rescues him through Jesus Christ. So then with my mind, I'm a slave to the law of sin. Excuse me. With my mind, I'm a slave to the law of God. But with my flesh, I'm a slave to the law of sin. In other words, my mind wants to follow God, but some part of me, the flesh, is corrupted. And it keeps pushing me towards sin. In verse eight, chapter 8, verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For, what God, has for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And to deal with sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. 
so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So up to this point, he's saying, even though you're a sinner, because of what Christ did for you on the cross, you're saved. God provided for your salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the good news. But I want you to see that he also introduces the Holy Spirit here. What is the role of the Spirit? And what he says here is he says, this salvation is for those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind of the, on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Romans 8, 6 is probably one of, is one of my favorite verses. Because it summarizes in one verse my daily battle, my daily struggle, and the truth I need to live by. Every day my flesh wants to sin. Every day. But I have a choice and I have hope. If the desires in my flesh well up within me and I allow my mind to follow my flesh and my mind thinks about how can I gratify, how can I satisfy the desires of my flesh? What's going to happen according to this verse? If I set my mind on the flesh, what happens? Death. Death. So, never mind about the gospel anymore for a minute. Paul's talking practically. His gospel is based on Jesus Christ, but he says there is no salvation in Jesus Christ unless we walk by the Spirit. Because Jesus Christ died for your sins, yes. But if you continue to put your mind on the flesh, you're still going to die. It will produce death. But if instead, when the flesh rises up, you say, no, I'm not going to put my mind on the things of the flesh. Instead, I'm going to listen for the voice of the Spirit and set my mind on how the Spirit is prompting me to, to do good, to love, to give, to praise, to worship, to fellowship, to grow, to think about beauty, all those good things that come from the Spirit. Then, what will be the result? I will experience life and peace. See, I think Paul is not talking about eternal salvation now. I think he's talking about current experience that leads on a trajectory to either to death or to life. And that's why these experiences, are, these verses are so powerful and so practical. Because we can have confidence that we're not saved by our works. We're saved by Christ. But in order to live in that salvation, we need to live by the Holy Spirit. And that's why my last three books are all on the Holy Spirit. is because I've become convinced that the teaching of Paul is that the Holy Spirit is the most important aspect of the practical Christian life. The most important. And so as you and I go forward today, tomorrow, for in, the, in the rest of our lives, Paul is saying the key to life and peace, he means inner peace, is the Holy Spirit and living by the Spirit. And at the same time, if you don't discipline yourself, if you don't shut off the mind of the flesh, the, the prompting of the flesh, and if you allow yourself, your mind to follow the desire of the flesh, you're going to bring death into your life. I'm not saying that you're going to drop dead here on the floor, but I'm, going to, I'm saying you're going to kill everything that's important to you. You corrupt your life. You corrupt your relationships. You hurt the people you love. You will hurt your church. 
You will hurt your society. Sin leads to death in this life as well as the next. That's Paul's theology. Romans 8, 6, 8, 7, For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. It can't. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay. That's Paul's pneumatology in brief. The other important passage we don't have time for is Galatians 5, 13-25. That's where he contrasts the desires of the flesh versus the, the impulses of the spirit. And then point number three, Christ has won the war over sin and death. We still need to fight the daily battles to defeat sin's influence in our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit. And here's where Ephesians 6 comes in, and we talked about that at length already. We don't need to talk about ecclesiology because we talked about that when we talked about Ephesians chapter 4. So we can skip that and, uh, and then the last part is ethics. And I'm just going to say a couple things about ethics. One is Paul assumes the ongoing validity of the Old Testament moral code. And that's Luther's third use of the law. And two, ethics flow from pneumatology. In other words, whatever the spirit desires, that's, a, that's what's good. If ethics is about defining what's good and doing what's good, then the Holy Spirit is the key to ethics because the Holy Spirit is the source of what's good. So if you want to study ethics, if you want to be an ethical person, you can study what's right and what's wrong by studying the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, the practical teachings of the, script, of the New Testament. All of that's important for ethics. But Paul's ethics are not just rules about what's right and wrong. Paul's ethics also demand that we have power from God to do what's good. Because remember what I said before from Romans 8, 7 and 8. That we, you and I don't have the power to do what's good on our own. Now let me explain. Can somebody who doesn't have the Spirit of God from another religion or another philosophy, can they do good things? Yes, of course they can do good things. They could give, they could give 100 jets to a poor person. They could, they could sponsor a child. Uh, they could give food to somebody who's hungry. I mean, anybody can do that. What Paul is saying is to really be able to do good in the world the way that God wants you to do good in the world is that it needs to flow out of the Holy Spirit of God. It needs to be empowered as an extension of God's love. You see, there are many people who do good to get political favor. They do good to get good high status. Or maybe they feel guilty and they, 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 they give alms or they give, good, give money so they feel less guilty. Well, those are, those are good deeds, but that's not the good that Paul's talking about. The good that Paul's talking about is, is to extend the love of God to somebody from the heart of God. So don't worry about can other people who aren't Christians do good. Just say yes, they can. But don't be satisfied with that. Because the good that comes up from the Spirit of God is something more than just doing good deeds. It's an expression of God. It's an expression of God's Spirit. It's an expression of Christ. That's Paul's ethics. So the question was, how do we know if we're living by the Spirit? How do we know if we're following the Spirit? The answer is going to be, if we do the things that come from the Spirit. That's how we know. If you don't do the things from the Spirit, you're going to do the things from the flesh. Those are the two choices. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, 
strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That relates to another question. Is if you don't follow the Spirit, can you lose your salvation? If you don't follow the Spirit, will you inherit the kingdom of God? Well, Paul says, if you follow the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what he says in this passage. By contrast, verse 22, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. All right? So, do you understand this teaching in Galatians? Does this make sense? Yes. It said there's two forces inside of us, the flesh and the Spirit. How do I know if I'm following the flesh? Paul says it's obvious. You're fighting, you're lying, you're cheating, you're doing immoral things, you're, you're angry, you're, you, you're doing all manners of evil. That's the flesh. How do I know if I'm doing the, following the Spirit? Well, they're the signs of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'll be doing good things in the world. I'll be loving other people. So these, like always, Paul gives you two stark contrasts. Okay, human experience is usually a mixture of those two. But in his teaching, he gives you two extreme opposites so that you can understand what he's saying. So now let's go back to this. Uh, I think I've answered questions one and two. And then, uh, okay, and I'm going to put, I'm going to move question nine up to, to make that question three. Can we lose our salvation after accepting Christ if we do not follow Christ? Paul does not answer that question. I'm sorry. Okay. And, and so, in Paul's teaching, it's like... He wants us to understand that there are two directions in life. We can go this way towards... Uh, well, okay, we can go this way towards salvation. We accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. We receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us into a new way of life. That's Paul's idea of salvation. And we walk in that light, in that life, in that love, all the days of our lives. That is salvation for Paul. And it goes this direction. And he makes his teaching very, very clear. He says, you, you were taught to put off your old self. That way is the way of the flesh. He says, put that off. Put on Christ and live for Christ. Right? And, and so what happens if you go this way? So I accept Jesus Christ, but I decide to follow the impulses of my flesh. I, I put my mind on the flesh. And I start to experience life, which is really death. Anger, fighting, immorality, rage. All the things that he just... We read about in chapter 1 of Romans, and we read about it in, in Galatians chapter 5. If we follow the flesh, we walk on a path like this, and we're going farther and farther. Okay, here. There we go. Problem solved. Okay, so we go like this. And so what some of you are asking is, if I follow the flesh, at what point 
Do I fall off into hell? Or at what point do I lose my salvation? Right? Because the truth is, nobody walks on this way all the time. And Christians don't walk this way all the time. Right? If I asked you, if, you, if I sat down with you and, and I said, tell me about your life. I think you would say, well, sometimes I'm walking by the Spirit and sometimes I'm walking by the flesh, right? I think that's, that's real experience. I believe that was also the experience of the early church. Because if, if the early church, if everybody was following the Spirit, Paul would not need to remind them to take off the flesh and put on Christ. He wouldn't need to teach them that, would he? Because they were already doing it. But they weren't doing it. And so the truth is that sometimes we walk this way, sometimes we walk this way, sometimes we walk this way, sometimes we walk this way. We go back and forth, back and forth in experience. So now some of you, some of you can accept that and say, okay, back and forth. But when do I go too far? When do I fall off? Because Paul says, if you keep going this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, he doesn't answer that question. In fact, nowhere in the New Testament do we get an answer to this question. How far is too far? So, if I'm, if I'm walking, let's, let, let's change this metaphor. If I'm walking outside and it's really, really dark, I can't, I can't see. But I know that somewhere over here is a cliff. You understand? And at some point, if I step over the edge, I'm going to fall to my death. What will I do if I know that? If I'm outside walking in the dark, I know it's over there, what am I going to do? What? What will I do? Will I try to get as close as I can? Where's that edge? Maybe, ah, I'm about to fall up. No, no, I'm going to try to get as far away, aren't I? It's like, I don't know where it is, so I'm going to stay far away. Right? Nalila? Okay, so do you understand the point? For the Christian life, if this way is the way of death, and that way is the way of life, don't ask where the line is. Just stay away. Get as far away from it as you can. Because that's the way of death. Yeah, but where's the line? If you want to know where the line is, that means you're thinking about sinning. You want to know how much sin can you do before it's too much? It's like, no, okay, you're, that's trouble. Because if you give your mind over to sin, it will pull you in more and more. So Paul's, Paul's answer is not to get, tell you where the line is, but to simply say, that's the way of death, that's the way of life. You want salvation, follow the way of life. Okay, and, and that, that's Paul. And I think it's very practical. So, but let me give you one more practical piece. So here I am, as a Christian, knowing that sometimes I, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to do this, but sometimes I'm looking over there, you know. <laughs> so, uh, sometimes maybe even going that way, okay? Sometimes. Well, I just, that's why our, our daily devotions are important. That's where daily prayer is important. Because when I'm doing that, I need to say, no, stop. I repent of my sins. And I need to turn my face this way. And because I know that as a human, I, I, I don't follow the Spirit perfectly, that's where I have to trust in the grace of God for my salvation. I will never say that I deserve salvation. Because I don't. I will trust in salvation. But I will never take it for granted. I will never say, I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. Who cares? I'm saved. No, that, that's fleshly thinking. If you think that way, I think you're going this way. Because the, the Father is personal, then I think we can think that the, that the Holy Spirit is personal. Not just power. Not just electricity. It, the Holy Spirit is God's presence with us. But it's very hard to define this 
because the Holy Spirit is also the Spirit of Christ. And Christ is with us, and Christ is personal. So really we have, when we say we have the Holy Spirit, we're really saying we have God the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at the same time. But that's really confusing. Uh, because of God the Father is usually thought of to be transcendent. And Christ is with us through the Spirit. Uh, if Jesus is not coming back, what hope would there be to continue in Christianity? That's a good question. I tried to answer that. I know how people would answer that who don't believe in Jesus coming back. They would say the hope is in you. You be a good person. You change the world. I don't believe it. Okay, I think we cannot change the world without God's power. We need God's power. And I don't think that God is, is going to give us his power and work in our lives just for us just to die. And so I think there is a life after death, a resurrection from the dead that Jesus experienced. I think that the resurrection of the dead is going to be the same as Christ coming back. And so the point is not, is Jesus coming in the clouds? The point is, is there going to be a resurrection of the dead? And is God going to create a new kingdom of God where Christ is the head? That's the main point. That's the hope. Uh, I won't, because we're almost out of time, I already did number 10. Number 11, to whom did Jesus pay the price of sin? Um, I don't think he did pay the price. I think it's just a metaphor. And this is the book I was referring to that you can read if you're interested about did God kill Jesus with the, with the seven different views of the atonement. Um, what's the difference between the rapture and the bodily resurrection? The rapture, how many of you come from churches that preach on the rapture? Raise your hand. Anybody talk about the rapture? Two, only two. Well, I don't want to confuse you, but some people believe that Jesus is coming back and taking the believers up to heaven. That's the rapture. They're alive, and they go to heaven. And then the rest of the world has to go through tribulation. That's the rapture. The bodily resurrection is, is for people who are dead. All the people who are believers in Christ are raised to new life. Not the living people are raised to go with God, but the dead people are raised and can have new life. Okay, we have to end uh, our time. And uh, I think we covered most of the questions. Uh, there's one on there that, that, that I think, I hope will come up again later. So let me close by giving you the benediction. Now may the God who loved you, died for you through Jesus Christ, his son, and gave you his Holy Spirit. May he work powerfully in you to lead you in the path of life, that you may reject sin, you may turn away from all those things that produce death in your life, so that you can experience the fullness of his salvation now as well as in eternity. Amen.